everyone. Thank you for joining me tonight. I'm Tracy King and I'm also known as the Bulletin Board Lady. Um, I blog at mrskingrocks.blogspot.com and you can find me on social media um, either as Tracy King or as the Bulletin Board Lady. So tonight kicks off an awesome series that I hope you love. One of my passions is using workstations in my music classroom and this year I'm going to kind of break that all down and if you've never done workstations I hope that you'll feel encouraged to give them a try and if you do workstations I hope that you get some new ideas for how to plan and organize for them and um, all sorts of different workstations that we can do. My plan is not to do a live video every week, um, although sometimes it may feel like it's every week you may see a lot of them, but some Workstation Wednesdays I'll post a blog post or a freebie or a new product and I'll share that with you on Wednesday as well so that um, each Wednesday you're getting some new Workstation wonderfulness. Um, I'll also set the video on um, to replay so if you're only here for a few minutes or if you um, have to go like anytime I watch my um, secret boyfriend David Rao um, I generally have to kind of go back and forth to take care of my daughter so um, I often go back and check the replay and I absolutely will make sure that that's posted for you so let's get started what is a workstation um, I use the word workstation and centers interchangeably. Um, so if I start saying centers instead of workstations, I really just mean the same thing. A workstation is just a place where our students can work in small groups in your classroom. Um, most of the time when I'm doing workstations, those are collaborative groups. So they're working together to solve a problem or to create a melody or something like that. But they don't have to always be collaborative groups. It could just be, it could just be independent work that they're doing while sitting together which is what happens when I'm at like doing worksheets or some um, assessments if they're with me. So it could work either way, but mostly my stations tend to be collaborative in nature. So why do workstations? Well, if you already are doing workstations, then you know that it's a great way to practice skills that you're working on in class. It's great to review concepts, it's also great for um, letting kids explore and go a little bit farther than what you can do in class because sometimes if you're limited to a workstation rotation that's like you know seven or eight minutes which is usually what mine are um, not everyone gets to do everything they need to do but if I set up a workstation um, specifically for kids to work ahead or maybe to for me to add some remediation then I really find that that helps me reach all of my learners and it certainly makes it much easier to individually assess kids um, especially when you have like four or five hundred kids that you need to hear or they need to play for you or or whatever and I found that doing that in a workstation is so much easier than having to do it as a whole group which is just intimidating for students and is a pain in my butt so I'm re I really like doing workstations for individual assessment as well. One of the questions that I get asked a lot is, how many kids are in a group in your workstation? Well, it really depends on the class and it depends on how many workstations I wanna do. And every time I said that, they're like, no, 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 but really, how many kids in a group? Okay, all right, four. Four is a great number of workstations, or for kids in workstations. Um, I found that um, if I'm dealing with 20 to 24 kids or so, I'll probably have three or four in a group. And it's fine if all the groups don't have the same number of kids because um, when you're working collaborative, collaboratively, um, the other kids will just pick up the slack for that. So I guess like the perfect number would be four but I've done workstations with three and I've done workstations with five and six successfully. Now the six was <laughs> something I don't recommend for the faint of heart because <laughs> that was a lot but again there's there's the answer four. 
is a great number. <laughs> um, I teach um, third, fourth, and fifth graders right now, so I'm gonna show you my room in just a little bit. And I taught K through 12, pre-K through eight, and a whole bunch of other things. So I'll, I'll be sharing some ideas that will work for students that are younger than my third, fourth, and fifth graders, as well as older than what they are. So if you're just tuning in, know that there's probably gonna be something for everyone. So I teach workstations about once every four or five class periods, unless we're preparing for a concert, which, you know, then they just have to suck it up and live without workstations for a couple months. I only see my kids once a week. And um, we really just, when we're prepping for a concert, there's just not time. So um, I also like to plan workstations, maybe that last week before Christmas break or the last week before spring break, or um, even the last week or so of school. Because first of all, now that I've done them for so long, it's easier on me and the kids I'm not sure if they caught on how much learning is taking place in these workstations because they beg to do them every time someone will come in and say are we doing stations today and again I stick to that whole you know once every fourth or fifth class you may be able to set it up differently have a friend that does workstations every music class um, she has her room set up so that um, the stations are already just there like she has a technology station and then near the rhythm instrument she has a playing station she has a library in her classroom and so the stations stay just the activities that she puts in them change and um in that way, she's able to just pull this out and say, okay, we have 10 minutes left. Go to the station that you were last time. And so they all go there. Now move to the next station. And I thought that was so clever because instead of having to track where everyone should be, you have them go back to the last one that they were at and then move in the rotation. And I like something that doesn't make a lot of paperwork. So yeah, anything less than three is awkward. You're right. <laughs> Thank you, secret boyfriend. Um, I agree. I've had, I had a really, really small first grade class and I think it was like 14. I know, 14, never had that again. And we did stations and it worked out. I wanted to do like five, six stations or so. So there were two and three in a group and it was, it was awkward. And those babies, they just tried the best that they could, but mm, yeah, yeah, not, not, but not the best. Although I must admit, sometimes I threatened to put kids in a group by themselves <laughs> just to motivate good behavior, but I rarely do that. So um, before you get started with workstations, um, whether you're planning to do them um, every class period, if you're planning like I do to do them every few weeks or so, you should have a plan. Um, my plan usually um, is centered around whatever concepts we're working on. Um, if we're working on the names of the trouble class staff, then five out of the six stations that they'll rotate to at that time will be about pitch names. So they'll either be playing boom whackers or they'll be doing a worksheet to name pitches or trouble club twister or uh, things like that just because I found that works better for me. And then often I'm one of the workstations and when they rotate to me, then I'll do some kind of assessment with them. Some um, little matching game or maybe with the littles, I've done singing games where I could listen to see how well they were matching pitch or if they could echo. And so having a plan about what you want to do or what you want to accomplish, think when they finish these stations, what skills do you hope that they've honed during that experience? So um, after you have a plan for what it is you want them to learn, then you're gonna pick out stations that you think they are capable of doing in whatever time that you have allotted. Um, I have 50 minutes and so I usually, at the beginning of class, I always go over the workstations. We talk about procedures, we talk, I walk around the room and I'm gonna walk you around the room in just a minute. We walk around the room and I'll say, at this station, you do this. And so I'll give them some tips. I also usually include um, like directions, either printed out on a sheet or scribbled on a card or something so that I don't 
have to remind them if they're the last group that gets to a certain station, they'll have some kind of instructions there so that they'll know what to do. So I teach the procedures. This is how we're going to rotate. This is what you're going to do at these stations. And then I divide whatever time I have left um, by however many number of stations I want to do. So if it takes me 10 minutes to get attendance, to walk through the workstations, to do all of that, then I have 40 minutes left. And so usually what that ends up being is seven to eight minutes for me, but um, I'm trying to be like the meanest teacher in the school. So if they're not ready, for um, rotation time, if they're not cleaned up and ready to go, then I take minutes off the next station. I'm like, oh my gosh, someone is not gonna get to play Trouble Club Twister today. Oh, how disappointing. I hope we can clean up faster next time. So that's kind of a motivator since everybody wants to get to do every single thing that's there. So then whatever time I have left, like I said, usually for me, it's seven or eight minutes. If you're just starting workstations for the first time or if you're dealing with a particularly um, challenging group, I would recommend that you add a minute or so for transition time when you're figuring out like how much time can we get at each station. And then for the love of all that is good and holy, set a timer. <laughs> Because, oh my gosh, you, if you, especially if you're walking around and you're engaging with the kids, you're going to get caught up with Johnny's new inventive way to play the recorder, you know, with both sides of his mouth or I don't know, through his nose or something. And, and then somebody's going to get cheated out of center time and they notice. So set a timer. I often set my phone. If I'm not using the smart board, I'll put a timer up on the smart board so that they can see that. And some very smart groups then about 20 seconds before will start cleaning up so that they're ready to go. So I love, love, love whenever they can manage some of that yourself. How do I always manage to get a big room or a room that I don't have to share? I am super loud. Um, so in most schools that I've been in, I'm kind of away from everything else and I've just been blessed. Uh, most of the rooms that I've been in have been really large. The room that I'm in now and that we're going to walk through in a bit is the smallest room that I've taught in. And so I still need a lot of stuff. So you can ask my um, custodians. They're always like, oh my gosh, you have so much crap. Take it home. I need every single bit of that. <laughs> so I'll walk you through some of that as well. And I'm so thankful that I don't have to share because honestly, I ain't got no room for nobody else in this classroom. <laughs> All right, so we've got this all planned out. We know what we're going to do. We've walked the kids through it. We've timed this out so that we have exactly the right time. And then it's time to go. Um, we'll talk a little bit about picking um, groups and how to do that on um, another episode, but basically it all boils down to I pick because um, I could be kind and just, hey, Denim, I could be kind and I could just say, um, oh, find a group of four and then there's chaos for a couple of minutes and then it's, you know, they're all with their friends, which means they're probably doing friend stuff more than they're doing music stuff. So I'm just mean and I'll just say one, two, three, four, you all are in this group. Please go to the library and get started or or, or whatever that would be. So I just, <laughs> I just pick them because I'm mean and I don't want them to have that chance. And I'm telling you, it works so great for me. I rarely have to rearrange people. So let me take you around and show you the stations that I have set up tonight. They're not completely set up because tomorrow is my first day of school and I didn't wanna drag tons of stuff out um, to show you, but I think you'll get the idea. All right, so hang on, I'm gonna move us. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, okay. So this is my room. This is the cabinets. I have a lot of nice storage. This is <laughs> the pool noodle corner. <laughs> Oh, we should probably talk about pool noodles someday. The front of my room, this is Kingland, where no other humans are allowed to go. 
and this is the back of my room. So I'm gonna walk you through what I have set up for today. So this is the back of my room that we're looking at, and I would have students um, move their chairs here together in a circle, and then they would use these singing rocks. I wonder if I can do this without dropping the iPad. So I've written a blog post about singing rocks. They are rocks with pictures or stickers uh, mod podged on them. And this is an activity that we would do in class before, um, oopsie, before I would have them do as a workstation. But this is a singing workstation and they would use these rocks to improvise a singing story, a ballad, if you will. And um, then what they do at this station is essentially they pick a rock and they make a story or they pick a couple of rocks and their story has to be sung. This is one that I generally kind of walk around with and make sure that they're singing it and just not speaking it. So I would just have them turn their circles or their chairs into a circle right here in the middle of the classroom. So back in the back corner, I have a library that I keep set up. We'll be there in just a second, but sometimes if I'm doing a ukulele station, we'll set up by the ukuleles, just pull out some chairs and add a stand and they can practice cording together. Um, I also have this set up often as a worksheet station so they can get their crayons and their paper. Um, my pencils are in a new place this year, but they should be over here. And so this might be a place that is essentially always set up, but I, it can change quite a bit. So this is my library. And um, these are new pillows this year. The rug is old. I did Star Wars last year, but the pillows are new for my magical music theme. And um, I set out a few books that I hope will grab their attention or might be something that maybe we've um, worked on in class, you know, done some activity to that I think they might like. This year I'm trying to sort a few because as we rotate, there'll be times when I'm going to ask them to look specifically for composer um, books or um, biographies or something like that. So I'll have to let you know how that goes. I haven't tried being very specific. Usually what I say when I'm walking around demonstrating stations, I'll say, boys and girls, oh, you gotta see this. Boys and girls, this is the library. Look at all of these books. Guess what you do when you're at this station? And they roll their eyes so loud you can hear it. And they'll say, oh, we read. I'm like, wonderful. I shouldn't hear any talking. And then we move to the next station. So near my desk, Mrs. Kingland, where no human is allowed to go except me, I've thrown down a tablecloth. This, to me, keeps um, the area kind of blocked off. So they know that I expect them to be on the tablecloth, not wallowing around, not rolling over to the people playing golf, just staying in this area. I find a cheap Walmart tablecloth keeps things so much more in control than just kind of putting stuff down um, and saying, stay in this area. Um, of course, my big kids will do that. But when I did this with first and second graders, man, they were everywhere. So let me tell you a little bit about this station. These are Zupal plates. Aren't they cool? You should love them, man, because you can't get them anymore. I've been teaching so long, they've discontinued paper plates. That's a weird thing to say, isn't it? Anyway, so I have a ton of these. You could um, just use pictures that you printed from clip art or anything else. Um, but the idea here is that they're going to lay out four plates and then they're going to take the lap packs, which I have a blog post about. I'll link that um, on their resources page so you can check that out. And they're free downloadable, so you can build your own lap packs. They're just papers that I've shoved in a paper protector and we use dry erase markers. You write on them and you can erase. So they take the plates and they would lay it out and say, uh, is that a beaver? I guess it is. Well, that's a funny one to use. Anyway, um, <laughs> beaver, peacock, pig, fish, and then they would clap it. Beaver, peacock, pig, fish, and then they would notate it 
on line A, and then they would create another one and add that, and they're creating um, this, uh, this rhythmic song that they can then perform. And I always say at the stations, as, as, unless the workstations, I always say that you're supposed to do the activity until it's time for you to move. So if they would finish the whole lap pack, then they would erase it and they would start all over and they would go back through that part again. And the more workstations that you can do that can they can just do over and over and over, the easier it will be because you'll have plenty that come up after a minute. Anytime I do note naming worksheets, I always have a, when you're finished, do this activity because, you know, when you know it, you know it and you can finish a worksheet in like 30 seconds or so. So having something that they can do and just do over and over and over is going to save you um, a lot of headache. All right, so let's take a look at the next station. So this was here. I have a new rug. Thank you, Texas. Woo! I won this at TMBA last year, and seriously, I like screamed and ran up the aisle like I was on The Price is Right. I was so excited. Oh my gosh. So this year, I've kind of rearranged my classroom around it, and one of the stations we're going to try with that this year is golf. And they're going to take this as a kid-sized putter. If you don't know what a putter is, Google it. I mean, you know what a golf club is, but apparently the putter is different and it's a different shape and there are kid ones and there are adult ones and there are ones with special handles. And anyway, there's a lot of different things that you can do with that. I work with an awesome coach and she just happened to have one at home that her kids didn't use and she had a real golf ball. And so the rules are that when you swing, the, the club can't go higher than your ankles because we don't really have a big space that we would be able to do that. And I just can't wait to see what we break first. So that's what would happen at this station. So we've kind of moved in a circle. We've started back here and walked through what possible workstations could be. And we've done the library and the zoo pile plates. There's the teacher's corner. Sometimes I even get to sit down when we do workstations. That's awesome. The treble clef activity. This would also be great for doing treble clef twister and so many other um, different games. We'll probably have a whole episode on that <laughs> eventually. So in this corner, I just turned some chairs around and you'll have to imagine just a little bit with me. Um, in this area, I would put um, a music stand and because the boom whackers are right there, they would be able to get the boom whackers and play along with some familiar folk songs and work as a team to play that. This is always a challenging station for them, even if they know the song because they're really trying to connect with the notation and make sure that they play at the right time. This would also be um, a great place to do like a rhythm instrument play along. I have um, rhythm stick reading station and triangle reading station and some other things like that. Super, super easy for kids to do, but it gives them an opportunity to play instruments maybe that they don't get, you know, a turn on very often in class. And you can find those in my Teachers Pay Teachers store. So then we're back. This was actually what I had my iPad on to um, talk to you earlier. But underneath it, I have these rhythm blocks. And there's also, I think there's a, a blog post about them. Um, and I have students put them together. Sometimes they just get to play and clap. Sometimes they have a specific mission here. But it's on a rolling cart. And you'll notice that there are a lot of sets of those rhythm blocks. Well, the reason that is, is because often when I start rhythm blocks, if we haven't, ooh, I'm crooked. If we haven't done much of that in class before, sometimes it takes a few times of having the rhythm blocks in our workstation for me to feel like they're really being successful and not just building cool things. Um, so this year, I'm going to try doing it as a small group first. And if you're nervous about doing workstations and you haven't done them before, maybe doing um, some activities with um, small groups. Maybe everybody does the same activity or maybe you do two different activities and then those groups switch. Something like that may help you get your feet wet and um, not break your brain if you're really anxious <laughs> about doing this kind of activity. So um, if you have any questions about how I set up or how I organize, 
um, please leave them in the comments and I will definitely get to them. If you have some workstation questions that I don't answer in this episode, I would love to be able to address them in future episodes. So if you really, really, really want to know how exactly do you, you know, how's the scope and sequence work or how does, I don't know, what do you do when you're trying to teach just so me? Are there activities that you can just do for that or whatever your questions might be. And I think that, um, that I will get to those either directly on this list. I'll definitely answer them, but we may even have a full um, session about that. All right, before we go, I'm going to show you a secret. I'm going to let you look inside my workstation cabinet. Okay. Isn't it kind of cool to be able to do that sometimes? So I don't know if you know this or not, but when you're doing a Facebook live and you post a question or a comment, they don't come up like instantly for me. There's a bit of a delay. So if I don't get to your question now, I will. It could just be that I got busy yakking instead of looking at your questions and just happened to miss it. Okay, so this, I totally cleaned out so much junk at the end of last junk. It was, it was really old stuff that um, I would never use again and that no one would ever use again. And it was sucking up a whole cabinet and I need some place for my toys. So I purged so much. I've been here for three years. It was time. And now I have space to show you my workstations. Okay. I think you'll be able to see in here. I'm going to pull you up just a little bit. All right. So in this cabinet, um, I have things sorted by the concept that I'll be teaching. So this would be the rhythm shelf. And here I have, these are from Kelly Paris. She is rhythmically yours on Etsy. And these are little twisty blocks. Holy schmoly, look her up, they're amazing. Um, then I have different activities. I have some dice. I have my bowling set that we use sometimes. I also have a really big bowling set that's up above the cabinets that we use sometimes. The next um, shelf is pitch and mostly pitch. Um, and so I have different things that I would use for here. I have some vocal exploration cards. Um, they're easy to make yourself. They're easy for the kids to make, or there are a ton of those on Teachers Pay Teachers, some for free even, so that you could find something that you'd be able to use. So um, clothespins, these are my bingo chips that I use when we sing the ABC song or sing um, a folk song with lyrics will um, put the chips over some of the words and then try to sing it without seeing all the words. Um, and then just some miscellaneous things. I've got a karaoke mic that's fun for um, singing stations. And I have some of these cool, oh my gosh, I just forgot the name of them. Um, rhythm, no. Oh my gosh, somebody help me. What are these called? I have 10 million of them and I just forgot. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what those are later. Um, my pitch matchups, those are in my store. And I have the coolest envelopes I want to show you. I'm jumping down to the singing and instruments. These envelopes are um, plastic. They have a zipper close. Can you see that? Yes, the top. And they have a lot of space in them. Um, my grand plan was to color code everything. So my rhythm were going to be purple with all of the stuff that they had in them. You can see my rhythm dice that are in there. And um, then, you know, singing was going to be a certain color. And then I get so excited putting all of my stations into these cool envelopes instead of patched up file folders or envelopes that I like reinforced with tape and, you know, you got to gotta do what you got to do. But I, I use so many that I need to um, make a second order. So these are from jampaper.com and um, in the link that has the resources from everything that I talked about tonight, you'll be able to go and see. I think these are like a nine by 12 and they have lots and lots of space in them. And I just drop everything that I would use in the envelope and they're so thick. Let me pull this rhythm dice out. This is one that we use for Yahtzee. And so you can see 
they expand quite a bit. So you can really cram a lot of stuff on in here too. And because they are um, transparent, instead of going through tons and tons of things or trying to alphabetize them, um, this is so, so convenient. And then when I set these out of station, I literally just unzip it and leave it at the station for the most part. So this, these envelopes really, really work for me. And then of course I use um, photo storage boxes. I think I've talked about those before um, that I use my pitch matchups and some other things in because they're also easy to tote around and you can get them with coupons from Michaels or Hobby Lobby or whatever. And they are super awesome for staying organized. So you can't see this bottom section really well. Um, I have, let me turn it around and help you out. Okay, so I have some Ozobots and some Stickbots. The Spectrums back there are Makey Makeys. I also have Boppets and Simon Says, that's fun. Um, the blocks in the back are the ones that you put together to make instruments. And the black bags have the virtual reality goggles in them. So this is um, how I'm storing my workstations, but it's not all of the workstations I have. So next door, is this fun? Are you guys like totally bored looking at my cabinet? You can totally tell me and I'll understand. So in this cabinet, it's all the stuff that will someday be workstations. So I have some of the chalkboard blocks from I think those were from Target. I have bags, I have winter erasers, um, straws and dice, and then I'm storing some of my crafty things that I use with stations just because I haven't drug everything out for the school year yet. So there are dabbers and dry erase markers and hole punches and scissors and some things like that. So I can kind of put all of the um, this is a work in progress kind of things in here. And also things that didn't fit anywhere else. Like this is my huge collection of uh, fly swatters or at least part of my collection. And we use that when we play um, swap the staff or swap the rhythm. If you purchase my um, music workstations mega bundle, there are some swap the rhythm things in there. So this is what um, I keep for them to use. And they love being able to pick out a fancy schmancy water in there and then I also keep supplies like um, play-doh and some other things I um, bought now this is gonna sit here forever I think because I've had no inspiration this is a really super extra large set of checkers and I thought oh my gosh I've got to make a workstation out of this I love these so much I've had them for about eight or nine months now and I still got nothing so if you have an idea for those really large checkers to work as any kind of music workstation, please let me know because I'm just, I'm not coming up with anything. <laughs> so that's a peek inside of my, my pre-workstation storage area. I also use it for props like for singing games or folk songs or just different things that I would use. A lot of the props go in there because the more they're out, the more um, those kids that struggle with self-control get into them. Um, and whenever I'm absent, sometimes crazy things happen. So I kind of just um, rotate them in and out as I need them for the most part. So yeah, maybe pitch checkers. That's what I was thinking too, but just not really sure how that would work. <laughs> There is, Kimberly, there's an article or a blog post about the stick bots, how I've used them. So if you check on my blog and search that, you can see that. Um, if there, uh, I will go back and I will check all of these questions and try to answer them um, once I um, close out the live. But I just wanted to thank you for joining me and to let you know that each Wednesday, whether it's a Facebook Live or Sometimes the, the tutorial might be better as a recorded video that I just post. Some weeks it will be an awesome freebie. Some weeks it'll be, oh my gosh, look what I found at Target. I'm going to make this with it. <laughs> so 
I hope that you find this series engaging and I hope that it makes your life just a little bit easier as you fall in love with using workstations and centers in your classroom. Thanks again for joining me.